Let's go ahead and uh, take out our Bibles, and uh, the first place that we're going to be taking a look in God's Word this morning is in Romans chapter 12, verse 21, last verse in chapter 12 of Romans, and uh, inside your service bulletins, you'll find these little blue sheets, these are our uh, sermon notes for today. They form our roadmap as we, as we take this walk with, with Jesus on this fine, almost spring morning. I guess it's spring here. Are there are other places it isn't, but here in the valley, we live in the kind of place where uh, summer and spring um, kind of fall in a little bit different ways, don't they? But as we take this walk with our Lord this morning, He's going to be showing us some, some specific things He wants us to take a look at that will apply to our lives. And that's marked out here on our roadmap here by the blanks that we have in our sermon notes, and we'll be filling those in together. There's also space there for you to be able to, to write down some of the things that God will be speaking into your heart and your life this morning. Take up your cross, Jesus said. That's what Christ followers do. We, we follow Jesus when it's easy. We also have to follow him when it's difficult and, and it's hard. And, and, and Jesus is very clear about this to his disciples, to those who, who will follow him. He's very honest and says, it, th th it's going to be a tough journey. It's going to be hard. But you're not going to walk that journey alone. You're not doing this in your own power. I'm going to be right there beside you, even though sometimes it, it feels like I'm not. Sometimes it feels like, like I'm a million miles away, and we've all been in those places. And if you never have been, you will be. It's where God grows us to, to look beyond what we feel feel and what we can see or what we can comprehend and to not just listen to our feelings and our emotions which can very often lead us in the wrong directions to not listen to them but to listen to his word where he says I will never forsake you never means never ever so anytime in your life where you feel like God left you hanging he didn't he was there. You just didn't see it. You just didn't feel it. But he was still there. The proof is that you made it through that particular hardship in your life. Now, you might think, uh, I didn't do a very good job. But the Lord says, you know what? You did what I wanted you to do. And we made that trip and that journey together. Taking up the cross and, 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 and hitting the road with the Lord. Yeah, it is, it's challenging. We know that. Most of us have have been with the Lord long enough to know that um, there's a lot of challenges here that we face. And probably one of the biggest ones here, and, and it's one that Jesus just needs to deal with head on for all of us. It's not just for some people. It's not just for particular individuals. It's for every one of us in this room, for all of you that are streaming this right now, and those of you who will watch this video feed sometime later, this message is for you. These words are for you. And that next step in our faith development is learning to say no to ourselves. And that's hard. And honestly, that's where our first parents failed. Our first parents said yes to themselves and no to God. God made it very clear. God made it very straightforward. Do this, don't do that. And instead, they fell into the temptation and decided to do what they wanted to do. They didn't, they didn't listen to, to God's clear command. They decided, I'm going to say yes to me and no to God. Now, they wouldn't have framed it that way because Satan is masterful at making you think that something is, that is wrong is maybe not so wrong, or maybe it's even okay, or you know what? This is actually a good idea. He's masterful at it, beloved. And so they fell into that trap. And that's where our first parents failed. And we're still dealing with that failure. It's sort of like if you think of God wanting to grow humanity, that the next step was that they would have overcome this temptation. And none of us knows what that would have been like because we didn't experience. We faltered. We failed. We didn't make it there. 
and we're still stuck in that same mistake, constantly recycling it over and over because now it's part of our spiritual DNA to be broken and fractured. And apart from God, there is no hope. What we see in Jesus, and especially the resurrected Jesus, is what it would have been like had Adam and Eve said no to themselves and yes to God. Jesus points out to us and shows and demonstrates in his own body, in his own life, in his own holiness, this is what the Father had in mind for you. It's one of the core reasons that Jesus came as a human being. The Son of God also becomes the Son of Man. We have this, this powerful blending and, and, and coming together of God and man in a uniquely powerful way. We call it the incarnation. You know, we... In theological circles, you know, we, we like to come up with our big $10 words. So there's a $10 word for you. Incarnation. It's just a Latin word that means to come in the flesh. Right? Spanish, what's the word for meat? Carne. That's carne. Incarnation. Get it? Right. Coming in the flesh. And it's such a simple statement to say, but it carries so much impact. That God, and this is so hard for us to understand, that God, the unchangeable, immutable God, chooses, chooses to become one of us. To come into our world. And we know all, the, all those reasons why he did it, how he had to, and, and, and to bridge that gulf between God and man because man failed, man has to make the, 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 the situation right, here's the problem, nobody, no one in humanity is good enough to do it because as we've said, we've all been bro born broken in sin. Jesus is the exception because he is uniquely divine, the son of God, but he's also uniquely human, the son of man, and these two persons come together in the one person of Jesus. I'm not going to get in the weeds about what all that means, but, but it demonstrates to us that God is passionately committed to us, to humanity. God didn't just create this universe, wind it up, and now steps back and say, let's see what happens. He is intimately involved in his creation, even though sometimes it seems like everything is crazy. Everything is going insane in our world. We, we look at how everything's turned upside down. We wonder, how can God let this go on? And beloved, we have to be mature enough as Christ followers to understand that the things that we see taking place in our world and, and all the hardships, all the evil, and all the upside downness of this world, it's not a failure on God's part, beloved. This is what sin looks like. This is what sin does. And the only way God could correct it other than going to the cross would have been just to wipe us all out, start all over again. Now, most of us, that's probably what we would have done. So, you know, I, I, I started building this thing, and man, that looks like a monstrosity. I think I'll just tear it down and, and, and start over new. But that's not how God chose to do it. And before God even spoke anything into existence... He knew what he was going to do. And he knew what we were going to do. He knew that although he created us in his image, and that he would give us that opportunity to grow and mature in our faith. Just like we talked about a couple weeks ago, that Jesus learned obedience to the Father. Why? In his human nature, it had to come under that obedience. Just as we have to come under that obedience. The Son of God is already perfectly obedient. But those two things have to come together. And Jesus is obedient where we were disobedient. That's where the, the, the story changes in the Garden of Eden. Is that whereas Adam and Eve chose to say yes to themselves, Jesus said no to himself and yes to what God wanted. How powerful is that? And that God is so committed that he says, I'm not going to just wipe the world out. I'm going to let this thing play itself out. 
And there's going to be a lot of hurt and pain and hardship and suffering and loss. But I'm not going to leave it to its own devices. I'm going to make an impact in this world. And we see that begin at Christmas. And then as Jesus ascends into heaven and, and the disciples are looking up and, and the angels come and say, why are you staring at the sky? Didn't Jesus tell you what to do? Didn't he tell you what to do? That as you go along to make disciples of all people, Jesus has not abandoned this world. He has planted me and he has planted you into this world as people who have been touched by the grace of God. We are God's connection in this world. We are God's saving grace in so many ways. In flesh and blood, we are here to reach those who don't know him, who don't have this relationship with God that we have. Because we have to understand that for God, he doesn't want anyone to be lost. Now, that doesn't mean that people won't be lost. But if they are, it's because of their own doing. It's not because of a lack of love. It's not because of a lack of commitment on God's part. It's not because the cross isn't powerful enough because it is. It's been done. Jesus says the words from the cross, it is finished. And it is. We are entrusted with bringing that great message to the world. Sometimes, though... We want to say no to that, to that purpose that God has for us. I, I, I don't want to do that. I, I want to do what I want to do. I got to be me. Who was it that sang that? It wasn't Frank Sinatra. Who, who was it? Was it Frank Sinatra? I got to be me. Or the other one too. Uh, I did it my way. See, that's... That's the cry of the broken human heart. To, to elevate that kind, of, that kind of attitude. I didn't need anybody's help. I did it all on my own. That is so far away from, from where God wants us to be. Our first point on the outline is this. Saying no to self. It's the hardest thing we can do. It really is. It, it is so hard. And God understands that, beloved. He doesn't, he doesn't think this is easy peasy. He knows that this goes right to the core of who we are and what we are and how challenging and how difficult it is for us to go against the grain of our broken nature. Paul addresses this in a, in a whole chapter in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 7. And he goes through this anguish that he as a Christ follower is appalled at what he can do. How he seems stuck in the same place that he, he wants to do the right things that he finds himself doing the wrong things. And when he says, I'm not going to do the wrong things, that's what he ends up doing. And that you can just see that throughout that chapter, the frustration building and building from within. And maybe you felt that and hopefully you have felt that frustration in your own life where you just feel like screaming because it's so dreadfully unfair. How come I can't get control of this area of my life? How come I can't overcome this? How come this keeps coming back at me? And look at how Paul wraps that up. He talks about that the old self is still thrashing around inside of us. And that's what keeps dragging us back. But because Christ lives in us now. And beloved, we have to be mature enough to understand what we're saying here, okay? But because Christ lives in us, those things, although they, they draw us into to areas that make us very frustrated with ourselves, we, we fail, we get angry about it, but God says, that is your old nature acting. Your new nature resents that. Your new nature doesn't want that. And it makes sense. They're at polar opposites to each other. The old nature doesn't want what the new nature is bringing. The new nature doesn't want what the old nature is bringing. Do you see the conflict? If you don't, you'll feel it. As a Christ follower, you will passionately feel that conflict that Paul is talking about. 
And as he wraps that, that, that chapter up, you can just feel the, 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 the feeling and the passion building up inside of him, coming out in this, who will save me from this body of living death? Frustration. Your frustration, mine. And then he says, but thank God that in Christ Jesus, its power is not mine to overcome it. But the power of the cross and the power of the grace that comes from what Jesus did at the cross. It's not that the cross has the power. You know what I'm talking about. It's the one who went to the cross that has the power. That's just sort of our shorthand way of saying it's the power of the cross that Jesus empowered it with by his own blood, by his own sacrifice. It is that which gives us the victory over our brokenness, even though we continue to stumble. Now, beloved, be mature in this and understand, I'm not saying that it's okay to continue to say no to God and yes to self. But what I am saying is that God provides the victory that even when that does happen, not in a flippant way that we come back and say, oh, well, big deal. God will just forgive me. Now, that's so far away from the Father's heart. It shows, because I know I've been there many times in my life, it shows my immaturity. And it shows that I don't understand the Father's love like I should in that, in that particular area of my life. Because it's not a license to sin. But it is the, the cure for sin. And the difference is that in humility, we can accept that although I have not been able to overcome this, I will continue to try. I will continue to strive for that goal. And even if I don't meet it in this life, I will meet it when Jesus calls me home. But in this life, I will have victory over it in this way. That even though I fail, I go to him who succeeded where I failed. And he says, I forgive you. Now, beloved, don't let it bother you anymore. Let it go. That's all the old stuff now. Concentrate on what's ahead. Live for me now, more fully. I've taken this weight, this burden away from you. Doesn't mean he's taken the sin away from you. I mean, as far as the power of it to, to trip you up and tangle you up, you still have to deal with that. But he's taken the consequences of it away. And he wants you to quit, quit worrying about that part of it and just keep moving forward. That's where the victory is. It's your victory because Jesus won it for you. It's not your victory because you won it for you. Saying no to ourselves, it's not in our nature. It just, it goes against our grain. In fact, the opposite is true. It's very much in our nature now because of what sin has done for us to say yes to ourselves and no to God. Saying no to ourselves requires all the strength that God's grace and his power can give so that we can follow through on saying no to ourselves. Even as we say no to, to things in our lives that are wrong, and, and, and demonstrably wrong, and, and they, they, are, they are sinful and, and destructive, but in our ability to say no to those things, we are actually making a sacrifice of our lives. We're saying no to what we want. It took me a long time to kind of unpack this because it seems so almost disrespectful to say, well, how can I sacrifice a sin? You know, that, that shouldn't be there anyway. And God says, yeah, of course it shouldn't be there, but it's part of who you are. And I know how hard it is for you to say no in this particular area of your life so that when you do say no to it and yes, to me, that's a victory. You've made a sacrifice. You're cutting against the grain. The new nature is winning out. And it gave me a whole different perspective, beloved, on, on how we deal with these things. That as we say no to certain patterns in our lives and, and as, we, as we try to push away from them, that God understands how hard it is for you. 
And he loves to see you take those steps of saying no. He knows what it costs you. It is a sacrifice. It's like what we were reading in our foundational passage today from Galatians. That it says that we have nailed our sins to his cross. That's what we're talking about here. As we say no to what we want, it's like we're, we're nailing those things to the cross and letting God deal with them. It's an awesome thing. Here it's in Romans 12, 21, it says this. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing, by doing good. There's a powerful spiritual principle at work here. It's not just about resisting temptation. It's about resisting temptation and then doing what is right. What do I mean by that? Let's say it's, it's in your nature to be kind of greedy. Okay? And so you're being tempted to be, to be greedy. You're, trying to, you're wanting to hold something back in your life right here. There's that temptation. Don't let that temptation conquer you. And God shows us how to, how, to, how to conquer it, the temptation. But conquer the evil by doing good. So what would that mean? That might mean then being generous in that area of your life where you're wanting to hold back. Maybe it's time to cut it loose. Isn't this really what the young man who came up to Jesus says, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere. I want to be one of your disciples. And he was sincere. He really, he really meant it. He did. And Jesus says, that's great. Go and sell everything that you have and follow me. He was very rich. And he just couldn't let it go. And he walks away. And that's where Jesus talks about how difficult it is to get into the kingdom of God. How wealth can get in the way. And that wealth in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's not money that is the root of all evil, right? It's the love of it. And there are people who have been blessed with incredible wealth who are very good and generous with their wealth. Because they know it's God's way of helping them to help other people. That's a great thing to be able to see it that way. I often wonder more about that story after that young man walked away. How long, maybe later on in life, that he finally realized his riches weren't getting him anywhere and finally became a follower of Jesus? I don't know. We never hear about it. But I like to think that maybe it happened. Sometimes we have to sit in the thing that kind of controls us for a while before we, we recognize that that thing that we thought was so great is turning to dust and ashes in our, very, in our very lives and we're not any happier. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Find the thing that Satan is temp tempting you to do or your own self is tempting you to do and then figure out what would be that virtue. That's the sin, what's the virtue? So in greed, that's the sin, right? So what's the vir virtue? Generosity. So be generous. And in that way, beloved, this is what's great, is you end up handing Satan a double defeat. You get a twofer. Because not only do you, you, you say no to what he wants, you're saying yes to what God wants, so he, he loses the opportunity for you to do something nasty in somebody else's life or, or, or to withhold something or whatever it might be. He loses that opportunity to be able to, to jump on you later because you fell. He loses that opportunity. And then he gets a double defeat because then you end up doing something good. It's like he prompted you to do something good. So maybe look at temptation not as simply the wrestling against the old nature. It, 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 it involves that. But look at it as make it in Satan's world that he's ringing the bell that it's time for me to do something good. Yeah. Make him tremble and make him think every time he wants to tempt you because he knows that the odds are when I tempt him or her in this way, they're going to go out and do something good that I don't like. 
hand him a double defeat. That might be something worth writing down up here. Hand him a double defeat by not only saying no, but then by doing the virtue that that temptation is trying to get you at. You see, he's, he's trying to, to work in a part in your life. See, he knows your weaknesses. And he's trying to exploit it. And so what, what God is doing is giving you the opportunity not only to say no and, and, and just sort of push, you know, to say, I, I, I'm not going to do that. And, and, and to sort of be in a defensive posture. Now he gives you the power to go into the offensive posture by doing something that brings honor to God. By finding that virtue. Because, beloved, think about it. If this is a weak area in your life, and you just simply say no to it, and then that's the end of it, you're not really growing out of that, that area of your life that, that, that you want to be free from. So if you're doing the good things that prompt you to, to go against that, that temptation, you begin to grow out of the temptation itself. You begin to experience the rewards of doing what God wants you to do. I don't mean that, that, that God's up there going to reward you with some sort of magic wand. You, you get the rewards in your own heart and your own life as you begin to see yourself grow. You begin to see yourself turning into to that person that God always wants you to be. And beloved, that is thrilling when you see that kind of growth in your own life. Give him that double defeat. He deserves it. Our next point on the outline is this. God said yes to you so you could live for him. God said yes to you. The cross is all about God's yes. It's no to sin, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But who pays the price for the, for the no to sin? Who's the one that, that pays for the price of sin? It's Jesus himself. The cross is God's resounding yes Jesus sacrifices his resounding yes that I forgive you, I love you, I'm committed to you so that now you can continue. And I use this a lot, I know. And I use it a lot because it's true, beloved. And I think it's the area where the church, not just one particular congregation, all churches, especially in our nation, in our culture right now, in the American culture, where we fail the most, is that we don't recognize that we are here to touch the world for God. That's our purpose. And whatever vocation, whatever way that God has, has gifted you and, and slotted you in this world, wherever you're at right now, God wants to use you in that capacity. So begin asking him, Lord, how do you want to use me? Coach, how do, you want me to, how do you want to play me in this situation? How can I bring the most honor and glory to you? How can I reach other people for you? Because we are God's lights in this world that we're to attract others to him. Let's take a look at 1 Peter 2, 24. We, we, we take a look at the one who was innocent, the, the one who was betrayed by us, by our sins, by our selfishness. We often look at someone like Peter and we think, how could Peter have done what he did? How could, how could he spend all that time with, with Jesus and then deny that he knows him? And, and we can understand, well, he was, he was pressured, he was frightened, he was scared, and we do awful things when we're pressured and frightened and scared but it was more than that this was a spiritual attack that Jesus warned Peter was coming his way Satan is asked to sift you to sift you like wheat but I prayed for you Peter and when you after you've fallen go and strengthen your brothers see Jesus knew how this was all going to turn out oh I will never deny you Lord and then everybody else yeah yeah I'm not gonna let Peter jump in on this one we're not going to either they all they all betrayed him it wasn't just Judas and I would argue the greater betrayal was among his friends who really did love him Judas never seemed to really understand who Jesus was and someone who doesn't really know us all that well really can't betray us that much. But when it's our closest friends, that hurts. 
And yet Jesus has presence of mind to say, Peter, I'll restore you. And then you encourage your brothers. And we learn. We look at Peter and we say, how could you do, do that? And yet we do it all the time. Every time you say yes to you and no to God, that's a betrayal. It's not so hard to get there after all, is it? Jesus is the innocent one who is betrayed by our selfish, self-centered ways. He's the one who pays the price that only he could pay. That's what it was all about anyway. Here's what it says in 1 Peter 2.24. Jesus, he personally carried our sins in his body. That's what's going on at Good Friday. Jesus carrying our sins in himself, in his body, on the cross, so that, here's, here's, the, here's what comes out of that, so that we can be dead to sin. That God can begin to put sin to death in our life. That we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. And then Peter takes a look at Isaiah's words, where he says, by his wounds you are healed. See the connection there. This was all done for you because Jesus knew that this was the only way. The Father knew this was the only way. The Holy Spirit knew this was the only way that the family could be brought back together by his death on the cross for us. Jesus didn't do this for himself. He did it for all humanity, not for just some but for everyone. Our last point on the outline is this. By die, daily dying to self, we can daily live to bless others. We can bless others in our lives. We're going to take a look at Romans 15, verses 2 and 3, just the first part of verse 3. But we're going to be taking that look at that next. By daily dying to self, we can daily live to bless others. In this way, we emulate Christ. We become, as the Bible would say, more Christ-like. We look like him more. This is how we become more like him. This must be our goal so that lives are reached, not just ours. So that lives are reached, lives are touched, and lives are transformed. See, that's the power. That's the power that God gives to this church. Not just this church. The church across the street and churches everywhere where Jesus Christ is worshipped and glorified as the living Son of God. This is the power that Jesus has given to the church. That ability to reach, to touch, and to use that transformative power that has worked in our lives to bring that to bear in the lives of those around us. It means we have to become more transparent in our lives not showing ourselves to be people who never stumble, never make mistakes. Nobody can relate to that, that, that kind of image besides the fact that it's not true. We're not perfect people. We're per people who are in desperate need daily of God's healing, transformative touch too. And that is what God has gifted His church to be able to do. That's why we spent so much time while I've been with you. Is helping to prime the pump, beloved. That the power of the growth of your church, of course it always comes through the power of God and the Holy Spirit and God's Word and all those things that we know. But you are the tools that make it happen. Church won't grow if you don't grow. If you don't grow to realizing that it's my role, my privilege, my honor to be someone that God wants to use to reach this community and then to reach this world for Christ. This is the power that is given to the church. Do not doubt it. If it's not working, it's because we're not accessing it. It's because we're saying no to what God wants and yes to what we want. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 15. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please himself. 
No, he certainly didn't. He lived to bring salvation to us, redemption to bring us back to the Father. As Paul reminds us, Jesus didn't live for himself. He, he didn't live to please his ego. He didn't look for what would benefit him, what would bring him honor, what would bring him glory. But instead, he put you first. He put you ahead of himself. Think about that. The moment of the cross, you were more important to him than himself. And if it had only been you that needed it, no, beloved, he would have done it. And gladly. This is the message that changes the world. This is the message of the church. Not some amorphous sort of institutional structure, the church. I mean the church that is you, that is me. God's presence in this world. If you wonder where God's presence is, look no further than yourself. For if Christ lives in you, the presence of Christ is in you. Jesus said, my servants will be where I am, and where I am, my servants will be. Guess what? He's in you. You're right exactly where God wants you to be. Right here. And this week, and the time to come, you are where God wants you to be. And in those places, do what God has given you to do. And to recognize that what a privilege, what an honor we get to do this. To live for him. To be him in our world and in our communities and in our relationships. To be who he is in ways that are going to touch the lives of others. So that we can make that godly difference in this world that connects people who didn't know Jesus, who loves them the way we know he loves us and them to connect them so that they do know him. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.